History of Math. We're up to lecture 20. And out of 26 lectures, uh, two exams and 26 lectures for the 28 class meetings uh, at CUNY. And we are looking at chapter 10, which is Euler's work in, or some of Euler's work, in number theory. And number theory is the study of the integers, especially the positive integers. And a useful central idea in number theory is that of a prime number. So we say an integer P is called a prime if P is at least two and the only divisors of P are plus minus one and plus minus P. And let me just recall, what is a divisor? D divides N or another way of saying the same thing D is a divisor of N. Everything is an integer. If N, when you divide it by D, gives you a quotient and the remainder is zero. So if N equals DQ, for some integer Q. And we say that a composite number, um, uh, n is composite. I'm only looking at positive integers. If n is at least two, and n is not prime. So, for example, if we take the number eleven, is this prime or composite? Can someone tell me? Prime or composite? Anyone out there? No one out there. Can anyone tell me if if this number is a prime number or a composite number? Uh, eleven. Yeah, eleven. Um, that's prime. Okay, good. Suppose we stuck a zero, stick a zero in the middle. One hundred and one. Is that prime or composite? So, it's a prime number. Okay, and how do you know it's prime? Because 101 has only two factors, one in its, itself. Right, and how do you know that? <laughs> um, my knowledge from math. <laughs> All right, let's see. What about if you stick another zero in? A thousand and one. Is that prime or composite? Uh, I would say no, because it, you could you're divide saying, it by um, you're saying, sorry, one. You're saying no to what? Oh, no. No, it's not prime. It is, um, it's a composite number. Okay. So how does it factor? Um, one, you could, it's divisible by one, um, uh, seven, and I think 11 and more. Let us see. So... Let's check. So suppose I divide seven into a thousand and one. It goes 34, 28, 2, 1, 7, 20. Yeah, exactly. So this is seven times 147. Is this right? Uh, 28, 2, 1, 143. So 143, is, yeah. Right. And what about 143? Is that prime or composite? No, because 
um, no, it's no, not sorry. prime. Well, you can't say no. If the question is, is it prime <laughs> or composite? That's not a yes or no 143 question. 143 is a composite number. Okay, because? Because it's divisible by 111 and so on and so forth. Let's see. So 11 into 143 goes 13 times. So 1,001 is 7 times 11 times 13. And these are all prime numbers. But in any case, this is the factorization of 1,001 into a product of primes. 101 is prime. Um, but this is composite. Hmm. It's not always clear. It's not so easy to tell whether a number is prime or composite. If I stick in another zero, one zero 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 one, is that prime or composite? Um, I don't know. I'm not going to ask you to do that because that might require a lot of computation to figure out. But telling whether or not a number is prime is extremely difficult in general. Uh, the list of primes, we already saw the sieve of Eratosthenes. Um, which says that if a number is not prime, it's divisible by a prime uh, less than the square root of the number. So for example, for 101, the square root of 101 is about 10. The only primes less than 10 are two, three, five, or seven. So if you wanna know if 101 is prime, you just have to see if it's divisible by two, three, five, or seven. If it's not divisible by any of these, then you know with a hundred percent certainty that it's composite. That it's that it's uh, uh, prime. You don't have to look at uh, any larger numbers. But in general, divisibility is hard. And um, finding prime numbers. is a hard problem. So, and one can say there is no known simple formula for primes. That is, um, like take a formula like n squared plus one. So what are the values of this? If n is one, this is two, let's say prime, yes or no, yes. If n is two, this is five, that's prime. If n is three, this is 10 which is not prime, so I should say no. Sorry, this is yes, this is no. Actually, if n is odd, then n squared is odd. So n squared plus one is even. So n squared plus one is not a prime, unless n is one, because the only even number that's prime is two. So I don't even have to look at odd numbers anymore. I could look at four, six, eight. Let's see if n is four, 16 plus one is 17. Yes, that's a prime. If n is six, n squared is 36 plus one is 37. Yes, that's a prime. If n is eight, eight squared is 64 plus one is 65. No, that's not a prime. If n is 10, 10 squared is 100, 101, yes, that's prime. If you take 12, 12 squared is 144 plus one is 145, clearly divisible by nine, that's not a prime. So it looks like uh, n squared plus one is prime, not for every number, but certainly for a lot of numbers. And it's a famous open question. Open means unsolved. Is n squared plus one 
prime for infinitely many integers n. So that's really a nice question. So, so n squared plus one, it's not a formula for primes, but at least it's something that's easy to calculate. And you can ask whether that's prime infinitely often. No one even knows that. Um, but people would like a simple function f of n, which is equal to prime, equal to a prime for all n. And no one knows that, but so none is known. But people have come up with different candidates. So for example, the French mathematician in the 17th century, Fermat, asked, or he actually claimed, 2 to the 2 to the power n. Well, this is obviously even, but add 1 is prime for all n. True or false? So let's make a table. If n is 1, you can actually ask, start with n equals 0. If n is 0, 2 to the 2 to the 0 plus 1. 2 to the 0 is 1, so that's 2 to the 1 plus 1, which is 2 plus 1 is 3, and that's a prime. n equal 1. 2 to the 2 to the first power plus 1 is 2 squared plus 1. Is 2 to the first power is 2. 2 squared is 4. 4 plus 1 is 5. That's prime. With n equal 2. 2 to the 2 squared plus 1 is 2 to the 4th plus 1. What is 2 to the 4th equal to? Um, 16. All right. 16 plus 1 is 17. That's prime. Right. So far, so good. What about n equal 3? 2 to the 2 cubed plus 1 is 2 to the 8th plus 1. 2 to the 8th is 256, plus 1 is 257. 257 is a small number. You can check if it's prime. You just have to square root of 257 um, is um, 15 or so. You just have to divide this by the primes less than 15 to see whether or not it's divisible. And it turns out it's not. So this is also a prime. So formula looks good. What about n equal 4? 2 to the 2 to the 4th plus 1. Let's see, 2 to the 4th is 2 to the 16th plus 1. Huh. Now the numbers are getting a little bit bigger. Um, what is 2 to the 16th equal to? Um, Let's see, 2 to the 10th is 1024. If you double that, you get 2048, 4096, let's see, 8192, I think, 11, 12, this is just 2 to the 13th. Um, Yeah. Um, if I multiply this by 8, because that'll be 2 to the 16th, I get 6, 8, 9, just 72, 73, 8, and 7 is 15, 
This is six five five three six plus one is sixty five thousand five hundred and thirty seven. Um, So it's a little bit harder by hand to check whether or not this is prime, but in fact it is. That is, it might take you half an hour to check and check your work, but maybe an hour, but it's not such a big deal. This is prime. So, okay. What about the next number, n equal to five? So this is two to the two to the fifth plus one. That's two to the 32nd plus one. Now this number is a little bit bigger. So if you work it out, it's not that big as, as numbers go, but uh, if we were living um, and doing everything by hand, this is 4,294,000. Um, Nine hundred sixty-seven thousand two hundred and ninety-seven, and it's this number prime, right? So Fermat had claimed, without much proof. I mean, the proof maybe is these first five lines, that two to the power two to the power n plus one is always a prime number. And we just check by hand that this is true for 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. We didn't check this one, but you can check it in its prime. But for n equal 5, where you get a number which is over 4 billion, this is a hard number to check by hand. That is, even if you use the sieve of Eratosthenes idea, which is this number would be divisible by a prime. If it's composite, it's divisible by a prime no bigger than its square root. Um, this square root um, is about um, 50,000 or so. You'd have to compute the first, the, all the primes up to about 50,000 and by hand divide them all into this number and see whether one divides it or not, right? And this had been um, a kind of like a challenge problem, an open problem for over a century, beginning with Fermat. So, so the question that was open, unsolved, is whether two to the two to the fifth plus one which is equal to four billion two hundred ninety four million nine sixty seven two ninety seven is prime or composite. That is the that was, until Euler's work, the unsolved problem. And in this chapter, the great theorem is 2 to the 2 to the 5th plus 1 is composite. So Fermat's conjecture, if you want to call it that, is false. It's not true that 2 to the 2 to n plus 1 is always a prime. 2 to the 2 to the 5th plus 1 is a composite number. And so my goal today is to prove this great theorem in chapter 10, um, which uses... Um, a little bit of number theory. And so, in fact, what Euler proved is that the number 641 
divides 2 to the 2 to the 5th plus 1. So this is an actual divisor of this number. Now, today, a number in the billions is a small number in the sense that computers can factor numbers in the billions in a fraction of a microsecond. Um, but that's because computers can do a lot of calculations quickly that you can't do by hand, right? I mean, computers can do millions of calculations per second. Um, but in the 18th century, there were no computers and a billion calculations wouldn't take a second. It would take uh, more than a lifetime. It couldn't be done. Okay. So to prove this result and to actually find an explicit divisor, um, it's not just a matter of luck. It takes some cleverness. So I'm going to prove a series of results that will lead to this, OK? So, so today's lecture is devoted to the proof of the great theorem in chapter 10, which is that the Fermat number 2 to the 2 to the 5th plus 1 is composite and in fact is divisible by 641, uh, which is, as it happens, a prime number. Okay. And one step in the proof is we will prove along the way what is sometimes called Fermat's little theorem, which says that if a prime P does not divide an integer a, a can be positive or negative, it doesn't matter, then P will divide, P must divide A to the power P minus one minus one. So if P does not divide A, then it absolutely will divide A to the P minus first power minus one. Okay, just as an example of this, suppose I take uh, P equals seven and A equal to five. So seven does not divide five. Seven does not divide five. I must show seven does divide five to the seven minus one minus one, which is five to the sixth power minus one. What is five to the sixth power? So if you look at the powers of five, five, 25, 125, multiply by five, 625, multiplied by five, I think I get um, 3125. Sorry, multiply this by 5, 31, 125. Because 5 times 25 is 125. Sorry, 30, 125. I, mean, I believe this is correct. And if I, so this is 5, this is 5 squared. This is 5 cubed. This is 5 to the fourth. This is 5 to the fifth. So I'm doing this by hand, so that's not very reliable, but five to the six, if I multiply this by five, uh, that'll be 150,000 and five times 125 is 625. Um, hope that's correct, but of course um, you never know. Um, so, in fact, I know it's wrong because five 
times five is 25, five twos are 10, five, this is 3,125. So this is 15,000, not 150,000. This is 15,625. So you should be checking my math. So five to the six minus one is 15, 625 minus one is 15,624. So by Fermat's little theorem, seven should divide this number. I don't know if it does, so let me just divide seven into 15,624. It divides it into um, 2,232. Let's see. So that's 14, 6, 2, 22, 3, 21, 14, 2. Right. So 15, 6, 24 is 7 times 22, 2,272. Sorry. Is that right? It, this is a three. Um, yeah. I mean, this is not a prime, but all I wanted to show is that seven divides this number and it does. That's just an example of Fermat's little theorem. Okay. So along the way to proving Euler's result is to prove Fermat's little theorem. And this is done step by step in the book. Um, and it's divided into a series of uh, small theorems. And I'm just going to go through them one by one. So, Let's see. So in the text, this is all done in a few pages. Um, starting on page 226 and ending um, Finally, on page 234. So I'm going to start that. So the first theorem, which is at the bottom of page 226, is very simple. It says, so P is always a prime number, and A is always an integer, a positive integer, or the book calls it a whole number, same thing. And the first result says that P divides the number A plus 1 to the P minus the number A to the P plus 1. Proof. Well, let's expand A plus 1 to the P by the binomial theorem. If you haven't learned the binomial theorem by now, um, make sure you know it by the exam, because this could easily be part of an exam question. You have to know the binomial theorem. This is a to the power p plus the binomial coefficient I'll write it in several ways. P choose one, A to the P minus one. And the binomial coefficient, P choose two, A to the P minus two. For any K between zero and P, you have A to the P minus K. The powers of A are decreasing. Binomial coefficient, P choose K. Down to finally, P choose 
P minus one A plus one, where the binomial coefficient P choose K is the following. It's, uh, you can write it in, in several ways. One is P times P minus one. The denominator is K factorial. And in the numerator, you take consecutive decreasing integers starting with P. So you have K of them all together. So P, P minus one, P minus two, down to P minus K minus one. That's this binomial coefficient. And this is always an integer. And if you look at this integer for k between 1 and p minus 1, k factorial, which is the product of all the positive integers up to k, k is at most p minus 1. There's no factor of p in this, because you're going from 1 up to k. And k is at most p minus 1. So there's no p in the denominator. So no factor of p in the denominator, k factorial. So when you cancel things out, because this is going to be an integer, so everything in the denominator cancels something in the numerator, the one thing which you know with 100% certainty doesn't get canceled. The one thing you know with 100% certainty is this P doesn't get canceled out. So this binomial coefficient is always a multiple of P. So A plus 1 to the P, you have A to the P, and it ends with a 1, but every term in the middle is P times something. You have A to the P minus 1, in general, the middle term is this binomial coefficient p choose k, a to the p minus k, and so forth. So when you expand a plus 1 to the p by the binomial theorem, you have an a to the p at the beginning and a 1 at the end. But in the middle, everything is divisible by P. So if I take A plus 1 to the P, and I subtract A to the P, and I subtract 1, I'm canceling this term and this term. I just get this sum. Let me use sigma notation. K goes from 1 to P minus 1. The binomial coefficient P choose K a to the p minus k. And each of these numbers, each of these bino binomial coefficients is a multiple of p. So this is divisible by p. And again, to see this written out, at least in slightly more detail, see page 227. Right? So half of the page is devoted to writing out some of these binomial coefficients explicitly. So let me just state that again at the top of this new page. So this is our first little theorem. P divides A plus one to the P minus a to the p plus 1 for all integers a. The next theorem says if p divides a to the p minus a, then p divides 
a plus one to the p minus a plus one. So again, these you have to look at these things carefully. We know p divides a plus one to the p minus a to the p plus one. It doesn't necessarily divide a plus one to the p minus a plus one, but if p divides a to the p minus a, then it does. And the proof is really one line if you choose the line uh, carefully. If p divides, this is just a little observation, so uh, note. If p divides m and p divides n, then p divides their sum, m plus n. And how would you prove that? So if p divides m, m is pq for some integer q. And if p divides n, n is pr for some integer r. So m plus n is pq plus pr, factor out the p, and you get p divides m plus n. So that's this little note. So we know that P divides this for every A. We're told that P, in this case, P also divides this. So P divides the sum of them. P divides a plus 1 to the p minus a to the p plus 1. And it divides a to the p minus a. So it divides their sum. And what is this? This is a plus 1 to the p minus a to the p plus a to the p, they cancel. And then I have minus one minus a, minus a plus one. So that's the proof. So this is very nice. What does this say? So let's look at this again more carefully. So P divides A to the P minus A implies P divides A plus one to the P minus A plus one. So for example, if you take A equal one, P divides A to the first power minus A. Let's see, sorry, um, I don't wanna say that. Um, P divides one to the P minus one, right? If I let A equal one, this is one to the P minus one, which is one minus one, which is zero, which is correct, right? Zero is P times zero. So P divides one to the P minus one. So therefore P divides, if A is one, A plus one is two, two to the P minus two. But if this is true for two, then P divides three to the P minus three, which means P divides, if I add one to three, four to the P minus four, and so on forever, just by induction, P divides A to the P minus A for all positive integers A. And this is actually the next theorem. 
in this list. P divides A to the P minus A for every positive integer. Of course, it's also true if A is zero, because you just get zero minus zero. And if A is, uh, if P is odd, if A is negative, this is a minus A to the P minus minus A is just minus this quantity. It's actually true for all integers. So we can now prove Fermat's little theorem. If P does not divide A, then P does divide A to the P minus one minus one. And the proof is, for every a, p divides a to the p minus a. But from this expression, you can factor out the a. This is a times a to the p minus 1 minus 1. So p divides this product. And if a prime, p divides a product. So this is just if prime p divides b times c, then either p divides b or p divides c, or both. But if p divides a product, it has to divide at least one of the factors. So p divides this product a times a to the p minus 1 minus 1. But we're told p doesn't divide a. Therefore, P must divide the second factor, A to the P minus one minus one. And that's what we wanted to prove. Okay. So now we have the tool we need to approach the great theorem in this chapter, which is that this Fermat number, two to the two to the fifth plus one, is not prime. And again, we do this carefully step by step. And the idea is um, we wanna prove that this number, so must prove two to the two to the fifth plus one is not prime or composite. And the problem is that this number by itself is too big just to do brute force division by one prime number after another. A number in the billions is too hard to do test divisions by hand. But by hand is all they had in the 18th century. They didn't have calculators or computers or any of that. So we want to somehow reduce this problem to let's say a very small amount of computation. So you can't so you can do it by hand. Um, so let's look at a series of results. And I'll follow the notation in the text. Theorem A says the following, because um, theorem A is by itself very silly. It says that if A is an even integer and P is prime, And a prime P divides A plus one. So you have an even integer and a prime P and P divides A plus one. Now, if A is even, A plus one is odd. 
So an odd number is not divisible by two. So any prime that divides an odd number must be odd. So therefore P is odd, which means you can write P in the form 2K plus one, okay? So that is really, if you think about it, very, very, very simple. Any prime that divides an odd number must be an odd prime, and every odd number can be written in the form 2K plus one. That's the definition of an odd number. Okay. And that's all there is to theorem A. So um, we're fixing two things throughout this whole discussion. A is always even, P is always prime. So if P, here P, we said P divides A plus one. If P, if P divides A squared plus one, and again, if A is even, A squared is even, A squared plus one is odd, then of course P is 2K plus one. But in fact, the theorem says P can be written as 4K plus one. Hmm. So why is that? So first of all, so proof. P divides the odd number, A squared plus one, implies P is odd. And so there are only two possibilities. If you take an odd number and you divide by four, you either get a remainder of one or you get a remainder of three. So I wanna show that this case is impossible. So this is a proof by contradiction. Assume P is of this form. We want to prove it's not. So we want to show this assumption leads to a contradiction. So suppose P is 4K plus three. So by Fermat's little theorem, P divides A to the P minus one minus one. What is that? That's A to the 4K plus three minus one minus one plus P we're assuming P is of the form 4K plus three. And they teach you that 4K plus three minus one is 4K plus two minus one. So this is 4K plus two is two times 2K plus one. So this is like A squared to the power of 2K plus one minus one. And this factors, this factors into a squared minus one times a squared to the two K, a squared to the two K minus one, a squared plus one. So again, here I'm using a factorization formula which we've used before. And if you don't know it, now's a good time to learn it. It says, if you have X to the N minus one, this always factors into X minus one times the sum of all the powers of X from X to the N minus one down to one. So the simplest example, X squared minus one is x minus one, x plus one. And x cubed minus one is x minus one, x squared plus x plus one. 
and x to the fourth minus one is x minus one times x cubed plus x squared plus x plus one. So, this is this factorization formula. So if I let x equal a squared and the exponent n be 2k plus 1, and I'm looking at the case when p is of the form 4k plus 3, so I'm just repeating what I had on the previous page, a to the p minus 1 minus 1. p minus 1 is 4k plus 2 minus 1. 4k plus 2 is 2 times 2k plus 1 minus 1. So I'm applying this formula with x equal a squared and n equal 2k plus 1. So I get a squared minus 1 a to the n minus 1 which is 2k. So a squared to the 2k is a to the 4k. Let me write this out in two steps. a squared to the 2k plus a squared to the 2k minus 1 all the way down to a squared plus 1. So this is a squared minus 1, a to the 4k plus a to the 4k minus 2 plus a to the 4k minus 4. These decreasing even powers of a a squared plus 1. And this is divisible by p. Because by Fermat's little theorem, p divides a to the p minus 1. So p does not divide a, therefore it divides a to the p minus 1 minus 1, which means p divides this. So what was our assumption here? What, how do we start with? This is a theorem. P divides A squared plus 1. And I want to show that P has to be a, form, a prime of the form 4K plus 1. So So let's just write this all out. Given, this is our assumption, P divides A squared plus 1. Let me show another algebraic identity. Um, So for all positive integers n, I just showed that x to the n minus 1 is x minus 1 times the sum of decreasing powers of x. What about x to the n plus 1? Does that factor? Well, this factors, it doesn't factor if n is 2. 
it does factor if n is 3. Suppose you had x cubed plus 1. That's x plus 1 times x squared minus x plus 1. In general, if n is odd, x to the n plus 1 is x plus 1 times an alternating series of powers of x. x to the n minus 1 minus x to the n minus 2 plus x to the n minus 3 and so forth minus x plus 1. So we have a factorization of x to the n minus 1 for all n, and we also have a factorization of x to the n plus 1, but only when the exponent is odd. Now, we just said that um, p divides a squared plus 1. So if I let x equal a squared, a squared to the n plus 1 is going to be a squared plus 1 times a squared n minus 1. I have this alternating series of powers of x squared for n odd. So whenever n is odd, a to the 2n plus 1 factors like this. Now, Suppose I let p be 4k plus 3. So p minus 1 is 4k plus 2 is 2 times 2k plus 1. So in this identity, let n be the odd number 2k plus 1. So then I get <coughs> a to the 2 times 2k plus 1, plus 1. What is this? This is 4k plus 2, which is p minus 1. So a to the p minus 1 plus 1 equals a squared plus 1 times a to the 4n minus 2, some other stuff. So again, uh, this is really very uh, uh, technical uh, compared to what you're used to in, if you've only taken fairly uh, beginning math classes. But this is just a lot of, there's no calculus here. There's no group theory or vector spaces. It's really just old fashioned algebra. Uh, and to understand what's going on, you really have to look at the book and understand each line word by word, really. Uh, so a to the p minus 1 plus 1 is divisible by p if p is a for prime of the form 4k plus 3. And I already saw, let's turn this page over, that... Uh, a to the p minus 1 is divisible by p. So a to the p minus 1 plus 1 is also divisible by p. So we have two a to the p minus 1. These two numbers are divisible by p. So if two numbers are divisible by p, so is their sum. And so is their difference. And a to the p minus 1 plus 1 minus a to the p minus 1 minus 1. These cancel. This is 1 plus 1 or 2 is divisible by p, which is false because p is an odd prime. And it's not even. It's not divisible by 2. So what I just showed using not a insubstantial amount of algebra, old-fashioned high school algebra, is um, that my prime p cannot be of the form 4k plus 3, which means it must be of the prime of the form 4k plus 1. So what I just proved is theorem b 
which says that if A is even, P is prime, P does not divide A, but P does divide A squared plus one, then P has to be odd because it's dividing an odd number. And it's not only odd, which means 2k plus 1, but it's of the form 4k plus 1. So this took some work, but let's just keep going a little bit more. And maybe this is the last of these sort of algebra type theorems I'll prove, but the next case would say the following. If A is even, P is prime, P does not divide A, but P does divide A cubed, A to the fourth plus one, then P is a prime of the form 8K plus one. Oh. So the theorem A said is, is that if P divides a to the first power plus one, then P is two to the first power plus one times some number K. Theorem B said that if P divides A squared plus one, then the prime P is of the form four K plus one, which is two squared K plus one. Problem C, theorem C says that if P divides a to the fourth plus one, which is a to the two squared plus one, then p is of the form 8k plus one, which is two cubed times k plus one. And you might think that the next theorem, the theorem d would say that Again, A is even, P is a prime, P doesn't divide A. If P divides A to the eighth plus one, which is A to the two cubed plus one, then P is a prime of the form two to the fourth K plus one or 16 K plus one. If P divides A to the 16th plus one, then P would be of the form two to the fifth K plus one. And if P divides a to the 32nd power plus one, then p would be of the form two to the 6k plus one. This is 32k plus one. This is 64k plus one. So all of these statements are true and they can all be proved step by step the way we just did. The general statement would be If P divides A to the power two to the N plus one, then P is of the form two to the N plus one K plus one. And that's what we're going to use in the special case, N equal to five. So if N equal five, two to the fifth is 32. This says that if P divides A to the 32nd power plus one, 
then P is of the form two to the sixth, sorry, um, yeah, um, two to the sixth, what is two to the sixth? 64 K plus one. Now, what is the nth Fermat number for F sub n? Two to the two to the n plus one. So the fifth Fermat number is two to the two to the fifth plus one, which is two to the 32nd plus one, which is um, just the number we've been looking at. Um, what is it? Four billion. 294 million, 967, 297. Now, let's apply this theorem with A equal to two. If P divides this number F5, then P must be of the form 64K plus one. So to check the primality of this number F5, two to the 32nd plus one, suffices to divide F5 only by primes of the form 64K plus one. And what are the primes of the form 64K plus one? Um, I don't know. We can start to make a table. K, 64K plus one prime, yes or no? So if K is one, 64 K plus one is 65, not a prime. K is two, 128 plus one is 129. You can see this is divisible by three, three times 43. So no, it's not a prime. K is three, Three times 64 is 192 plus one is 193. And yes, that is a prime. Oh, so then you do your test division. Divide 193 into F5. Does it divide? No. So, no. Okay. Um, when K is four, four times 64 is 256 plus one is 257. Yes, that's a prime. But when you test, do your test division, it doesn't divide. When K is five, 64 times five is 321 which is clearly three times 107, it's not a prime, so forget about it. When K is six, you get 385, which is definitely not a prime. When K is seven, you get 449. And yes, that is a prime, but when you do the test division, it doesn't work. When K is eight, you get 513, this is divisible by three. This is three times 171, I think. So it's not a prime. When K is nine, nine, 64 times nine is 577. That is a prime, but test division doesn't work. When K is 10, 64 times 10 
if 640 plus 1 is 641, yes, that is a prime. And when you do your test division, yes, it does divide. So this number, what was the number? 4 billion, 294 million, 967,297 is divisible by 641. This is 641 times 6,700,417. ,400 so this proves the great theorem F5, which is 2 to the 2 to the 5th plus 1, is not prime. So Fermat's conjecture isn't right. Now, of course, if you learn Maple or any other computer algebra program, you can do this in a microsecond today. Let me... Uh, switch, let me share my screen with the Maple worksheet. So you should be seeing a Maple worksheet and there is a uh, command in Maple called is prime. So if you type in a number like 71, it's like you're asking the question, is 71 or 71 is prime true or false true if you say is prime 73 that's a true statement is prime 75 oops shouldn't have a dot there how did that get there let me get rid of that 75 is prime, that's false. So we're interested in the nth Fermat number. Let's just ask Maple, is this prime or not? Is prime. Two to the power two to the fifth plus one. False. So Maple tells us in a second or less that this number is in prime. And if you want to factor it, the command for factoring an integer in Maple is I factor, factor into integers. Ah, there. I mean, it took Euler a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to do this, but Maple just factored it. Huh. Let's see if, let's see how far Maple can go. Let's write a little program. So let's say for n from zero to seven do, n do. If is prime two to the two to the n plus one, then I factor the number well then let's just say then print let me try this yes and i factor the number else Print no. And if. Let's see if this works. 
Let's go to five. So why doesn't this one work? Let's see, I'm having trouble with this loop, so let's just do it differently. Let's try this. Oops. Hmm, doesn't want to print it. So we already did this for n equal five. But I think if not, so, so we're saying if it's false that 2 to the n plus 1 is fine, then we're going to factor it. There it is. So that's factor. And then what about for n equals 6? Oh, n equals 6 also factors. n equals 7 factors. Oh. Fermat was way off. Ah, 2 to the 2 to the 8th plus 1 is prime. Okay, let's try 9. Oops. Let's try 8 again. What about nine? Huh. Actually, this says that it's still working. It's taking a long time. Let's go back to seven. Yeah, so when n equals seven, the seventh Fermat number factors. Now when n is eight, what is this number? Two to the n, no? 2 to the 2 to the n plus 1. What is that number? Oh, when n is 8, that's the number. And Maple is still trying to factor it, I think. Let's try 9. Yeah. So even Maple is having trouble doing this calculation. Huh. So this humongous number, 
is two to the two to the ninth plus one. And this red symbol means the maple is still calculating. So we'll say goodbye to it. Um, so even with a fairly fast desk computer, um, it's hard working this out. But in the case in question in chapter 10, uh, the fifth Fermat number uh, is composite and 641 is a factor of it. And 641 is a number of the form 64K plus one. So that, that's our lesson for the day. Huh. Okay. Any questions about this? Um, I will uh, send out probably uh, tomorrow a kind of a review sheet for the exam. And I'm happy to spend all day Monday in class uh, going over review questions or asking answering any questions you might have about any of the material in these first uh, in these uh, second uh, five chapters, chapters six through ten. And after the exam, we have spring break, and when we come back, I think we have exactly five classes left and two chapters. So it works out perfectly because I try to spend two days on each chapter. So we'll spend two days when we come back on chapter 11, two days on chapter 12, and the fifth day will be reviewed for the final, and then we have the final. Okay. Any, any, any questions before we leave for the morning? Uh, again, I remind you I have uh, problem sessions on Zoom, which are underutilized. Uh, but I'm there. Uh, I think the next one is tomorrow, Thursday at 7. And uh, I would encourage you to log in if you have some questions. All right, all. All right. A question? Uh, no, no. I just want to say I hope you have a good day, Professor. Well, thank you very much. All right. Be well. Next class is next Monday. Yep. Bye.